Well, good evening and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's hopefully November 29th. Sure. Um, <laughs> so tonight we're going to be, well, I'm going to be presenting on a topic, uh, signlessness, as it's discussed in the poly canon. And this presentation is going to focus on the role of signlessness in the poly canon, as I said. Uh, earlier this year, um, Biku Anilayo released a book titled The Signless and the Deathless on the realization of Nirvana, which is on your slide. And his stated purpose was to reflect on those subjects for himself. And so he spent some time studying several Pali texts and their Chinese and Tibetan parallels, which he uses to glean additional details and to provide different perspectives on some of the stuff in the original Pali canon. So I got a copy of this book for my personal study and about halfway through the section on signlessness, I wanted to share what I was reading with the Sangha. Now, that being said, what I'm presenting tonight is uh, mostly a book report, and I think it would be generous to call it much more than that. So what you're about to get is my understanding of Bhikkhu Analayo's understanding of Shakyamuni Buddha's disciples' understanding <laughs> of what Shakyamuni Buddha said signlessness is and how we can apply it. The subject itself is quite interesting. Uh, the concept of signlessness lies at the intersection of the early Buddhist perspectives on consciousness and perception, and it ties together the fundamental Buddhist doctrines of non-self, impermanence, shunyata, or emptiness, and the problem of dukkha, dissatisfaction, or suffering in life. It is theoretical in that it is at the heart of the Buddhist theory of liberation from dukkha, and it's also practical in that the Buddha taught meditative practices designed to achieve it. Now, because we are a Mahayana tradition and many of the source texts that we interact with were originally written in Sanskrit, the terminology we use differs slightly from the terminology in Pali texts. For that reason, there will inevitably be some language mixing in this presentation, but I'm doing my best to clarify the terminology used and to try to minimize that issue when necessary by mostly relying on English translations of relevant terms. Last but not least, my hope is that this presentation helps tie together some of the teachings that we mentioned from week to week. Uh, because of the complexity and number of Buddhist teachings, they often appear to be discrete units, but the Buddha was trying to convey an entire worldview that had awakened within him. And one of the methods he used was distilling important points into lists so they could be more readily taught to others for their benefit. But at the end of the day, this method of teaching was not meant to teach us all a set of lists that we could rattle off at each other. Uh, we're meant to keep those principles in mind as we progress, building our understanding until we also awaken. <laughs> so to understand why signlessness is important, we need to understand what a sign is, how signs relate to perception, and how grasping at signs is a major source of dissatisfaction. The original term we're referring to is the Pali and Sanskrit word nimitta, Analayo defines this as what stands for, wow, that font is very small on the, the resolution is not so great for that, I apologize. Uh, he defines signs as what stands for the characteristic mark of things, that which signals to the perceiver what the thing is, thereby enabling recognition. In other words, at its most basic level, the sign is an indicator that distinguishes something from other things, its most obvious characteristic. It's what allows us to recognize what we are perceiving. End quote, that's his definition. Um, so let's try and clarify this. So when we see something, we receive raw perceptual information. And within that, there's something recognizable to us. And that is what is being referred to as the sign. So by taking up this sign, we connect what we are seeing to the associations and the evaluations ongoing in our minds. Interestingly enough, signs don't have to be accurate to function. This is actually a central concern of early Buddhists who realize that signs are influenced by the mental state of the person perceiving them. Analayo puts the Buddhist conception of the sign in dialogue with the 19th century philosopher Hermann von Helmholtz, who noted that signs do not have to be accurate as long as they are consistent. As long as the same object under the same circumstances produces the same sign, we don't have a problem. Helmholtz also reasoned that just because sensory experiences are based on signs does not make them illusory. They are a sign of something that exists or is happening, which is a view that's remarkably similar to the Buddhist one, which contends that though our perceptions are illusory, 
we are nonetheless perceiving something. Analyte further elucidates his understanding of the sign by using the example of hybrid images, or what are sometimes called magic eye pictures, in which a patterned image reveals a second image depending on the viewing distance. And you might have messed with these before as a child or as an adult. An example illustrating the sign from the Pali Canon is the story of a monk who, after a long absence from his family, returns to their home to visit and is recognized by a servant. Though his outer appearance has changed dramatically, he has a shaved head and is wearing robes. The servant takes up the sign, or nimitta, of his hands, feet, and voice. Because so much of his outer appearance has changed, the servant's ability to recognize him relies on features that are less amenable to change. This episode illustrates how the function of recognition trains the mind to focus on what is relatively permanent. Ignoring the impermanence of things is built into the way we perceive the world around us. Each act of recognition strengthens our tendency to ignore impermanence and reinforces our mistaken view that there are permanent things. And uh, I have D.H. Robert De Niro here as another example sort of illustrating this point. In these two pictures, even though he was de-aged digitally for a film, uh, we can easily recognize that this is the same person. But if we were to actually look at the details, the face is not the same. And so what we're doing is, there's something about this picture that we can pick out the features that don't really seem to change that much from his face between these two sort of ages, even though one's digitally created. And this is, I guess we could say, the sign of De Niro. <clears throat> One of the strategies provided in Theravada exegesis for correcting the tendency to see permanence where there isn't any is to meditate on impermanence. If mental conditioning is causing our misperception, then the, then the solution is to recondition our perception so that we're still able to take up signs to recognize things, but we do not mistake them for having permanence. This first example is concerned with how we take up signs as a matter of perception, but the Pali Canon provides another interesting anecdote that Analayo relays in which the Buddha addresses a man he sees as if he were a householder because of his appearance. The man corrects him saying that he's abandoned his wealth and responsibilities, so he's not actually a householder anymore. To which the Buddha replies that the form of address wasn't made to offend him, it merely reflected the sign presented by this person based on his clothing and his appearance. And I think it's an important point that whether we're thinking about it or not, we signal to others who we are by how we externally present ourselves, which is another side of how we relate to signs in general. And additionally, signs stand in relation to language and concepts. And to illustrate this, Analayo quotes a Chinese parallel text, which states that uh, following on perception, one in turn verbalizes. This is said to be known uh, to be knowing the results of perception. So you could talk about this topic for a long time, but we have enough of an intuition about signs that we can move on to the notion of grasping at signs. The act of taking up a sign involves this mixing of subjective evaluations into perception. So in our typical experience, our subjective evaluations are projected onto things out there instead of being understood as arising in the mind. If the mind is already full of defilements like greed, anger, and ignorance, these unwholesome states are projected onto things out there, and we begin to construct an unwholesome world. And structurally, this is a feedback loop. The more we perceive and project unwholesome characteristics, the more we perceive unwholesome characteristics in the world, and the more we ascribe unwholesome characteristics back to the things out there, on and on. This does not mean that we should try to abandon the information from the senses altogether, but that we should guard them through paying attention to what signs we are grasping at. And this ability is developed through training. We're cautioned not to avoid characteristics either, but to avoid grasping uh, what are called secondary characteristics, which are the subjective elaborations that we are making on the first order perceptions, which is just the raw things we are perceiving. Analayo characterizes Buddhism as taking a middle position between idealism and realism in that it does not deny the existence of the world outside of the mind while claiming that our perception, and thus our way of experiencing that reality through the senses, is mentally constructed. He quotes a sutra in which the Buddha says, and I love this quote, The end of the world cannot be reached by walking, yet there is no making an end of dukkha without reaching the end of the world. <clears throat> 
In the Pali version of this sutra, the monks in attendance are unable to understand the Buddha's meaning, surprisingly enough, and question Ananda, who tries to clarify for them by saying, friends, that by which in the world one becomes a perceiver of the world and a conceiver of the world, that is called the world in the noble one's discipline. This indicates that the Buddha is saying that to make an end of dukkha, one must undo the version of the world that we create with our minds. Echoing the Buddhist description of the mental construction of reality, Analayo quotes the psychologist Feldman Barrett, who writes, and this is a quote, we humans are architects of our own experiences. We actively participate in constructing our experiences, even though we are mostly unaware of that fact. And then later, your perceptions are so vivid and immediate that they compel you to believe that you experience the world as it is, when you actually experience a world of your own construction. Much of what you experience as the outside world begins in your head. Now that we have some idea of why signs are relevant, we can discuss Buddhist practices based on countering their influence. The first of these is uh, called bare awareness. And bare awareness is what people often refer to as mindfulness in the US, sort of collapsing the definition. <clears throat> the phrase bare awareness is not based on a specific Pali or Sanskrit term. It's a descriptive term that Analayo uses to describe the practice, and it's used elsewhere as well. He locates it in the story of a non-Buddhist seeker named Bahia. And Bahia erroneously considers himself to be an arhat, and he's corrected by a former relative who appears to him as a celestial being. And this being informs him that he's not even on the path to becoming an arhat, and tells him to go talk to the Buddha. After tracking down the Buddha, Bahia interrupts his alms round, asking him for a teaching. And despite the Buddha telling him that the time is inappropriate, Bahia insists, and so the Buddha gives him the following teaching. Therefore, Bahia, you should train yourself like this. In what is seen, there will just be what is seen. In what is heard, there will be just what is heard. In what is sensed, there will be just what is sensed. In what is cognized, there will be just what is cognized. Bahia, you should train yourself like this. Bahia, when for you, in what is seen, there will be just what is seen. In what is heard, there will be just what is heard. In what is sensed, there will be just what is sensed. In what is cognized, there will be just what is cognized. Then, Bahia, you will not be thereby. Bahia, when you will not be thereby, then, Bahia, you will not be therein. Bahia, when you will not be therein, then, Bahia, you will, you will be neither here nor beyond, nor between the two. Just this is the end of Dukkha. By decoupling seeing at a functional level from what is seen, this distances us from our normal, unquestioned involvement in the interplay of sense experiences. We're putting a slight distance between bare sense experiences and constructed sense experiences. In interpreting this passage, Analayo states that not thereby is referring to how bare awareness stops us from being carried away by what we perceive. Not therein is the consequence which, fo which follows. We're able to free ourselves from taking firm stances on what we perceive. By not being carried away and not taking firm stance, the sense of self is allowed to diminish, and we no longer identify with the senses here in the passage, its object there or beyond, and their interaction between the two. This freedom leads us to uh, a term I enjoy, stepping out of dukkha. And the Pali Canon relates a story where the Buddha uses bare awareness also to manage physical pain. Uh, he says in one passage, my body is just like an old cart, which by being expediently patched up and adjusted, reaches the place to which it is going. By expedient strength, I can maintain it alive a little longer. Through my own strength and effort, putting up with these painful feelings. When I do not give attention to any signs and enter signless concentration, then my body is at ease and there are no afflictions. A possible explanation for how this works is illustrated by an uh, example from another sutra, the example of being shot with an arrow, explained by the Buddha. The arrow causes us pain, but the aversion we experience toward that pain is like being shot by a second arrow. And this is the dukkha created by our construction of the experience of being shot by the arrow. 
The first pain is unavoidable. You just got shot with an arrow. But the second pain is avoidable. By separating the two through bare awareness, we remove the second arrow. And this is an example of not grasping at the sign of pain, as he puts it. And bare awareness is also applied to unwholesome thoughts and specifically to conceit, which is considered a mental defilement. And conceit is interesting in that it is associated with forms like hubris, arrogance, and self-building. This makes it particularly difficult to ferret out compared to unwholesome desires, ill will, and the desire to cause harm to others, which are a lot easier for us to recognize. A classic antidote to conceit is contemplation of impermanence. One takes the source of conceit when it is perceived and realizes the impermanence of the source. For example, if we're conceited about our physical appearance, we can remind ourselves that this appearance changes throughout our life as we age and cannot be preserved. Another antidote is signlessness. If we train to not grasp at signs in the first place, the source of conceit never reaches the second order of becoming conceit. Instead, by focusing on the constructed nature of conceit, it's recognized as just another experience that comes and goes. So compared to bare awareness, a uh, second method the Buddha teaches to counteract the influence of signs is what is called the signless concentration. Signless concentration does not preclude the arising of defilements later. The Pali Canon contains a simile in which a powerful army enters the forest and the crickets immediately fall silent. And we would not imagine that the arrival of the army permanently stopped those crickets and that they're probably going to resume chirping later. And of course, these crickets are like these signs that we keep taking up. Analaya looks to a specific form formulation from the Chinese Agamas, a parallel text to the Pali Canon, not present in the original Pali, which identifies the elements of signless concentration as not taking up any sign and contemplating the element or essence of signlessness. If we are not paying attention to signs, we must be paying attention to something as this is an ever-present aspect of our minds, at least according to uh, the Abhidharma texts and the Pali Canon generally. Thus, our attention should be on the absence of signs if we're going to avoid taking them up. So typically when we meditate, we have some object of meditation, for instance, the breath. So how can we meditate on the absence of something? Analayo mentions a few strategies. So we've often heard of the term mindfulness or sati, but the Pali Canon also mentions something called non-mindfulness or asati. Non-mindfulness requires mindfulness as a prerequisite. So first we see the unwholesome mental action. This is through mindfulness. For instance, a feeling or an irritation, and then we counter the unwholesome thought by choosing not to pay attention to it. It's fairly obvious. <laughs> Another strategy is to be aware of the lack of unwholesome thoughts when we're experiencing wholesome ones. Additionally, we could see our unwholesome thoughts as not being us, as not being identified with ourselves. But there also appear to be two ways of understanding the characteristics of signless concentration. In the Pali Canon, a nun describes her meditative concentration saying that, quote, not leaning forward and not leaning backward, concentration is reached without exertion by holding in check and restraining. Through being freed, one is stable. Through being stable, one is contented. And through being contented, one is not agitated. And the Chinese parallel text puts this relationship of stability and freedom as being sort of reciprocal instead of the linear way that this, this nun presents it. So in that case, stability frees us and being freed in turn restabilizes us. So you can start with either one and they're sort of mutually reinforcing. But in both descriptions, freedom and stability go hand in hand. According to Analayo, this clarifies that a feeling of discontent is what pushes the mind to grasp for signs in the first place. Additionally, an exegetical text based on the Chinese parallel describes signless concentration as, quote, keeping all volitional constructions like a water dike, end quote, which indicates the subtlety of signless concentration compared to the practice of bare awareness, where we're sort of still paying attention to these sense experiences and just letting them happen. And Analayo identifies this passage as referring to moving away from forceful application of the mind to recognizing signs 
and instead it favors diminishing mental exertion so the volitional constructions do not arise. The consequence of this type of practice is profound in that it actually calls into question the tendency of the mind to fabricate experiences in the first place. By the way, when we use the term volitional constructions, this is one of the five aggregates, and we translate it as discrimination uh, in the version of the Heart Sutra that we recite. So you see it every week. With respect to other states of meditative concentration, signless concentration is distinguished from other sort of high states like the fourth immaterial sphere, known as neither perception nor non-perception, which is considered a very difficult and high degree of meditative attainment in which one moves beyond the duality of perceiving and not perceiving the input of the senses. The Buddha, having attained this concentration, chose to move beyond it, not taking up the sign of neither perception nor non-perception. In other words, even at this high level of meditative achievement, the Buddha uses signless concentration as a way to counteract and move beyond what some believe to be the highest possible state of consciousness. According to the canon, signless concentration applied completely also leads one to become an arhat. This is reflected in the ideal of what was referred to as the unestablished consciousness in which when one dies uh, and is no longer reborn by reaching nirvana, and this is the final goal of Theravada Buddhism, generally. And signlessness has a relationship to contemplation on emptiness, or shunyata. We should keep in mind that to characterize something as empty, or shunya, relates to its lack of some quality. Analaya uses the example of a building being empty of people. In an early Buddhist context, emptiness is used to clarify that all aspects of subjective experience are entirely empty of a self or some kind of permanent entity or substance. In other words, there is nothing in our experiences that persists forever. Analayo presents the following Chinese parallel text. Suppose monastics sit down in an empty place at the root of a tree and well contemplate form as being impermanent, being of a nature to wear away and to fade away. In the same way, they contemplate feeling tone, perception, volitional constructions, consciousness as being impermanent, being of a nature to wear away and to fade away. Contemplating those aggregates as being impermanent, of a nature to wear away, to be unstable and to change, their minds are delighted, purified, and liberated. This is called concentration on emptiness. Those who contemplate in this way, even though they are not yet able to be free from conceit, purify their knowledge and vision. Furthermore, with right attention and concentration, they contemplate the abandoning of the sign of forms and the abandoning of the sign of sounds, odors, flavors, tangibles, and mental objects. This is called concentration on signlessness. Those who contemplate in this way, even though they are not yet free from conceit, purify their knowledge and vision. It's the end of that section. And this discourse continues on, explaining that the concentration on nothingness, which follows the concentration on signlessness, is achieved by abandoning the signs, and finally the practitioner becomes aware that the notions of I and mine arise from whatever appears to the senses. When considering the permanence or impermanence of what causes consciousness, it becomes evident that all the causes and conditions of consciousness are impermanent, of the nature to fade away, and should be abandoned with the cultivation of understanding. Mm -hmm. Analayo provides a common, uh, complementary perspective from the smaller discourse on emptiness from the Pali Canon, and it depicts a gradual meditative approach to emptiness that results in signless concentration as its sort of final stage. The Pali version moves through a series of layered realizations of emptiness. First, the monks contemplate their dwelling, their dwelling place, which is empty of the chaos of secular life. In this case, there are no elephants or horses there. And then this discourse moves through, moves progressively through perception of the forest, and then the earth, and then into what are called the immaterial spheres. We mentioned one of them earlier, which consists of infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception nor non-perception. And with each successive each successive level, they see that it's empty of what characterized the previous level. The versions of this text that were preserved in. Uh, the Chinese, Tibetan, and Pali canons diverge at the step of the signless concentration. The Chinese text emphasizes not delighting in attainment, and the Tibetan version emphasizes not becoming attached to attainment. 
Analayo points out that the poly version provides a practical tool for avoiding both of these <clears throat> possibilities. One understands that, quote, even the signless concentration of the mind is constructed and produced by volition. Whatever is constructed and produced by volition is impermanent and of a nature to cease. In the end, even this journey through subtler and subtler experiences of perception comes to an end, and we return to daily life. But the fact remains that the experiences of these states are tools to transform the mind for our use on and off the cushion. So just briefly, we're actually doing all right on time despite the slow start. Aside from the exact descriptions and terminology, the Buddhist understanding of consciousness in the Pali Canon echoes views that are held by many psychologists. Namely that while there is a material world that we are inhabiting, our experience of that world is largely mentally constructed. Because the central goal of early Buddhism is to step out of dukkha, this knowledge is applied then to transforming our construction of the world. If much of our dissatisfaction and pain comes from how we perceive the world, and that form of perception is the result of mental conditioning, it stands to reason that the answer is to recondition our minds, to change the way that we see the world. At the end of the day, seeing the world as it really is, is not an option. Our experience of the world is always mediated and constructed, and so it becomes our task to learn how to accept that fact and live with it to the best of our ability with the tools available to us. That's it. Thank you very much. And uh, before we open it up for general questions, comments, and thoughts, uh, Ichishima Sensei, uh, do you have anything that you would like to add? <clears throat> thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much for introducing the sign business in the party canon. And uh, I'd like to just uh, add the uh, Mahayana uh, perceptions uh, by Kamarashira, uh, who was active around the end of eight centuries in India and uh, Tibet. Uh, he recorded the process of meditative actualization and especially calmness and discernment, shamatha and vipassana. Uh, let me read uh, just part of it. Bhagavan also said, when a being actualizes discernment and calmness, he is freed from the bonds of science, nimitta bandana, and the bond of evil states. Uh, so uh, one who seeks to get rid of all obstruction should devote himself to calmness and discernment. By the power of calmness, thought, becomes unshakable in relation to its own object, like a lamp in a windless place. By the discernment, the light of right knowledge arises due to understanding the reality of dharmas as they are. All obstruction is thereby gotten rid of as is darkness owing to the appearance of light. This is the beginning part of the Bhavanakrama, by Kamarashira. I think this is very interesting. Uh, he really introduced the uh, Indian style of meditations to Tibet. And uh, he debated against the uh, Mahayana version from China, uh, who, um, support, uh, who is uh, on behalf of the Southern Enlightenment Meditation Group. So just uh, uh, I remind this is uh, our translation when I was in, in uh, Hawaii as a missionary uh, 50 years ago. And we translated the uh, Bhavana Krama, the third process of Bhavana Krama by Kamarashira from Sanskrit into English language, which appeared later in the Taisho University's Comprehensive Studies journals. Thank you. This is just my suggestion. Thank you very much, Roshan. And Sensei, did you have anything to like that? Thank you. I, I want to clarify when I'm when I said it's one of my favorite subjects. Um, and I was thinking about it as uh, Itchishima Sensei was mentioning it because he had introduced it to me from the Tibetan concept, mm -hmm. not from the Pali concept. <laughs> but what I found was uh, one of the reasons it's one of my favorite topics is because of dealing with the nature of consciousness. 
And I'm gonna, next month, I'm going to be produce, uh, presenting something by Philip Goff again that has to do with, with consciousness specifically in his, his latest book, which came out a month ago uh, on that. And so I found it really interesting that you were giving us a primer on what Philip Goff talks about. <laughs> but he's talking about it from modern Western philosophy that's advised by um, uh, physics and mm -hmm. astrophysics. So it's sort of interesting to see how those are sort of converging, how those ideas are converging now, even though they were established centuries ago or millennia ago, uh, yeah. specifically. Uh, but we're now coming around to that, to a very similar viewpoint that was revealed uh, several millennia ago. So <laughs> I, I yeah. find it really interesting. So stay tuned for Philip Goff. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, well, I'm glad that it plays into a uh, few future presentations as well. Uh, I'm interested in the topic for similar reasons that um, it's interesting to think about uh, how we think about how we think about the world and the degree to which we're sort of constructing it as we as we go through it, and the ability to which we can affect yeah. how we perceive things. And, and I like I like the the point that you made, which was maybe made by the by the uh, big shoe, mm -hmm. which is that. Shakyamuni Buddha was not attempting to teach anything specifically, but rather creating a worldview. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what we miss quite often. We miss it as teachings in terms of like uh, follow A, B, C, three, you know, down the line, as opposed to a worldview, which is more inclusive and more and more uh, embracing. And so I think that's really interesting. Yeah, that's that's my point actually, because it's something okay. I struggled with when I was first um, sort of getting interested in Buddhism. Was well, a good trying point to keep all of these things <laughs> in mind, and then realizing that well, what had happened is somebody had had this profound experience of awakening, and then who wants to share it with people? Well, I mean, imagine you know now if you just started trying to um, explain to somebody how you see the world, like, and giving them the tools so that they could sort of understand that worldview and be on the same page with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, how would you do it? I think he did a pretty good job, all <laughs> things considered. But he's trying to make it so that it's easy to memorize and be passed around so right. that more people can learn it. I'm going to go ahead and stop the what, share. So yeah, we're going we'll to go stop, we're gonna stop the uh, recording and open it up for questions. Can 